message is the last of a series of messages from the book of John, chapter 5. And our text today will be from verse 28 to verse 30. It's entitled, Judgment Saved Life. So in the past several weeks, we have learned that life through Christ is really a very distinct life. Uh, the reality check on the first message reminds us that life through Christ will be opposed. There will be those who have cherished beliefs that they hold firmly and those beliefs can oppose life through Christ. For example, they believe in the supremacy of religious laws, in ceremony over divine acts of mercy, and they have a strong unbelief in the deity of Christ. They do not believe that Christ is God. Our message too was on the dependent life. We learned that life through Christ is completely dependent upon the Father. There were four areas we see the complete dependence of Jesus upon the Father. His activities, His love, His power, and His judgment. Jesus only did what He sees the Father is doing. His mind was forward thinking and His emotion felt the heartbeat of the Heavenly Father. He lived in complete obedience to the Father. Last Sunday, we learned that life through Christ is really eternal life. There are three descriptions of this eternal life. How it is received by trusting Christ and by surrendering to His Lordship. What is the essence of this eternal life? The enjoyment of freedom from judgment of sin, which is death, understood as eternal separation from God. And who grants this life? No other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Today, we will be talking about the topic, Judgment Saved Life. But first, let's stand and read all together our text from John 5, starting from verse 28 until verse 30. Everyone, would you please read this all aloud together. Let's go. Do not be amazed at this, for your time is coming, for all who are in the grace will hear His voice. And come out, those who are done with good, who rise to live, and those who are done with evil, who rise to evil, and those who are done with evil, who rise to Life through Christ is saved from judgment. The judgment that results from sin is death, understood as eternal separation from God. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 6 verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, in Christ Jesus our Lord. To be in Christ is to be declared not guilty of sin, therefore no longer punishable by death. I'd like to share two natures of this judgment that we're talking about in this passage. First, the judgment is for both the dead and the living. The context of the previous passage is about judgment for those who are alive. And so if you look back on verse 24 that we looked at earlier, we read, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. 
It is apparent that this statement was basically directed to the listeners. What a marvelous declaration indeed. But here is even more of a remarkable statement that is provided with a disclaimer. Do not be amazed at this time. And the verse continues, For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. And those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. It appears that Jesus knew the thoughts of those who were listening. Thus he warned them to not be amazed. In effect, the Lord is declaring in no ambiguous terms that he is God. How foolish it is for anyone to predict the bodies lying in the grave would one day hear his voice. Only God could ever support such statement. And when they hear the voice, they will come out of the grave and proceed to the direction upon which they were judged from the start. Now, lest you misunderstand what verse 29 is saying, it is not teaching that people will be saved because of their works. So if you look at verse 29, it says, And those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Verse 29 is not saying that our way to salvation is a way of works. We will have a problem with the rest of the New Testament if we entertain that kind of thought. For, for example, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, the Apostle Paul clarifies this to us. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so to help clarify the matter, I'd like to share with you two components that make salvation possible, according to the Ephesians chapter two passage. First is grace. Grace refers to the unmerited favor of God. To someone who calls upon his name. The Apostle Paul sometimes refers to the good news of salvation as the gospel of grace. So we read in Acts 20 verse 24, However I consider my life worth nothing to me, if only I may finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus Christ has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. The book of Galatians is a brief dissertation of the gospel due to God's grace and not resulting from works. And works here is understood as observance of religious laws. Emphasis on the grace component of the gospel erases any thought of human works or efforts as necessary in the experience of salvation. For if works is the requirement for salvation, then those who experience salvation will no longer attribute their experience to Christ. The eventual outcome of that is to take pride in one's work and not to attribute the glory to God. To take pride in one's work is completely the opposite of what Paul warned the Ephesians when he mentioned lest 
anyone should boast. So when we experience salvation because of God's grace, there is really nothing in us that we can boast about. The Lord saved us not because we have done something good, not because we are good, but because in spite of the fact that we are not good and we're not capable of doing good, God is gracious to us. And how do we know He is gracious? He sent his only son to die at the cross for us. Since grace is unmerited, any recipient cannot take pride in having grace. If you work for it, it's no longer grace. It's what we call salary or wage. You know, you work so hard, after the 15th day, your employer pays you. And the reason why he pays you is because you worked for it. Now, if he gives you something without your working for it, then that's going to be grace. The second component is faith. The grace of God is activated by the human response of faith. Faith meaning childlike trust in God and in His promises. A person is saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, not because of His good works. Clearly, therefore, since salvation is by grace, the only possible human response is to believe it and not to work for it. And a demonstration of this faith is to accept the offer, the gift of salvation. You see, salvation is a gift. We respond by faith when we receive that offer. Otherwise, if we do not receive, the offer remains an offer. It is not going to be ours. A gift remains a special gift unless it is accepted. When it is accepted, the ownership is now upon the recipient. And this act of receiving, biblically, is evidenced by repentance of sin and the claiming or the appropriation of divine forgiveness. Now when the person experiences salvation, he is compelled by his newfound faith to do good works. That is the place of works. That is what being a new creation is all about. Ephesians 2 verse 10 teaches that when Christ rules the heart of the person, that person is now bound to do good works. Thus the good works done by the person in verse 29 of John 5 is the result of his personal salvation and not the cause of it. On the other hand, the evil deeds that another person demonstrates are really the outcome of the fact that that person has not experienced salvation in Christ. You see, the person has not trusted the Lord and has not surrendered to his Lordship. Consequently, that same person really has no power within himself to do good works. The best of us falls short of God's standard of holy living and of goodness in life. Another way to demonstrate this truth is this. Good works are the fruit of salvation and not the root. The dead who trusted Christ will be raised to eternal life. The dead who did not trust in Christ will rise from the grave and proceed to eternal condemnation. 
And so, biblically, the only way to escape this judgment of eternal condemnation is to repent of sin, to accept the offer of forgiveness in Christ, and completely surrender to His Lordship. There is no other way. Christ Himself declared this once and for all. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am emphasizing the Greek article ho, which we read the. All right? My English grammar teacher would tell me that's how we differentiate the from the. You know, T-H-E can be read the, the place, the restaurant. But if you want to emphasize that the T-H-E is not an ordinary the, you have to say the. Because that means there is no other. So when Jesus says, I am the way, there is no other way. When he says, I am the truth, there is no other truth apart from Jesus. When he says, I am the life, there is no other life. That's how rich the Greek language is compared to the English language where we do not differentiate the article V. Anyone, therefore, who introduces an alternative way to God is not telling the truth. This reminds me of a missionary. I told you about this, but it's worth saying again. He was riding the bus from Baguio in the Philippines, the northern Philippines, to Manila. And he was sharing the gospel with an older fellow. And he says, um, you know, Jesus says that is the only way, is the only truth, the only life. So you cannot go to heaven apart from Jesus. And this man says, oh no, I don't believe in that. And then he says, you know why? Because like when I travel from Baguio, there are so many ways to go to Manila. You can go to La Union, right? And the missionary lovingly reminded the older fellow, he says, you know, I am talking about the way to heaven. I'm not talking about the way to Manila. <laughs> there is only one way. And that's the way of the cross. Now you might have several ways to go to Garland or to go to Oklahoma, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about going to heaven. So don't use your own personal illustrations to compare that with what God says. The reason I say this is because a lot of people have trouble about this. They think religion can bring them to heaven. They think philosophy. Some even think morality. You know, I'll just be good. You know, and I heard somebody say, you know, when my life ends, God balances the good and the bad. You know, and if the good outweighs the bad, then I'll go to heaven. And I respond, uh, what verse is that? Do you know what verse is that? There is no verse to support that. The second nature of this judgment is it is impartial. Look at verse 30. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. And my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Three reasons for this impartial judgment. First, 
Jesus does not act selfishly. Look at the passage again. By myself, I can do nothing. There is no selfish motive which accompanies the judgment of Christ. There is nothing that influences his decision in terms of personal advantage. I recall when my daughter was competing for the TMEA, the Texas Music Educators Association. They sponsored the competition for everyone to be a part of the Texas State Choir. So they have to go through screening at different levels, school, region, pre-area, area, and then the state levels. In each of these levels, each competitor is given a number to represent their identity. They're not called by their names. They're called by their number. And when it's time for them to sing, they go to a room where the judge cannot see them, or the judges cannot see them. Tina Rachel described it to me as, there is like a canvas type divider that separates the competitor from the judges. And the reason I was, I was informed is that so that the judges will not have any influencing factor in determining the quality of performance. In this case, simply the voice. So items that usually influence people's decision are filtered. The judges cannot see the color of one's skin, the facial appearance, the height, the weight, the hair, the garment they wear. The students were simply judged by their voice. Compare this today with some talent competitions that we see on TV, where a judge would say, oh, you look so nice with your outfit tonight. And I think, I thought this is a singing competition. Or someone will tell a heart-rending story about how he was abandoned by his parents and how he lived on the streets and the judges would really patronizingly favor this particular a uh, con contestant because the story is just so compelling and I think I thought they're judging the singing what I'm saying to you is this the judgment of these people is so flawed because they allow many other factors to contribute in their whole equation of judging well, in the primary issue of your eternal destiny, Jesus Christ will not make judgment because of the color of your skin or because of the outfit that you wear when you come to church services, your height or your weight or what you wear. This is the primary error of Samuel when he was looking for a king. You see, while in search for the king, he visited the children of Jesse. And he was so impressed when Eliab, one of the sons, arrived that he thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 6-7. Compare that with our tendency today, when a young man, for example, watches a young woman pass by, he would say, oh, she is so pretty, she will be my wife. Or a young woman will do the same. Oh, look how cool he looks like. He is going to be my husband. You haven't even known this person. You have already made a commitment. No wonder the divorce rate in this country is now towards one out of two or three 
marriages. Jesus Christ, our Lord, makes his judgment with no other influencing factors other than what he hears from the Father. Which brings us to our second reason about why this judgment is impartial. Jesus judges as he hears. Look at this passage. I judge only as I hear. The big question is, what does Jesus listen to? Well, it is clear from the context that he hears only the Father. Remember John 5, 19? Those of you who have graduated from experiencing God, this is one of your favorites. The Son can do nothing by Himself. He can do only what He sees His Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. The hearing in verse 30 corresponds to the seeing in verse 19. It signifies the complete dependence of Jesus upon the Father, which compels him to do only what the Father does. This includes the dispensing of judgment. Therefore, since his judgment is the Father's judgment, it is only fair and just or impartial. There is no other influencing factor that gets incorporated into the process of making the judgment. In the court of law, a good judge is someone who remains objective in looking at the case before the court. What evidence is presented to substantiate the prosecution's case? What proofs are provided by the defense to strengthen their witness? The judge does not listen to the radio for someone's opinion and then base his judgment based on what he heard. The same judge does not watch TV to gather additional material. This judge does not read the daily newspaper to get the result of the recent polls and determine who is going to be favored or not. In other words, in the desire to remain objective, the judge will not allow any other material to influence his decision except those which are presented in his presence. That's why in, a, in many, many important cases, the members of the jury are sequestered. Or if they do not do the sequestration, they are going to issue a gag order. Which means you cannot talk about it. You cannot listen to the radio. You cannot discuss among your fellow judges. Because if you do, then you are incorporating additional material in the process of judgment. To Jesus, what is most important is what the Father says about the person. Is this person declared not guilty? because of the substituting power of Christ at the cross to pass judgment from death to life or not. In making judgment, it is only what the Father says that the Son will follow. There is no other factor that gets involved. The third reason why the judgment is impartial is because Jesus judges to please the Father. For I seek not to please myself, but Him who sent me. So by now we have learned that the intimacy of Jesus with the Father is such that what He thinks and feels are what the Father thinks and feels. Jesus did not do anything to seek personal advantage. He has no prejudice whatsoever. Neither does he have any preconceived notion about anything that will color his decisions. Neither did he seek any personal favor, nor did he want personal pleasure. 
Jesus had only one motivation that governed his action, and that is, will it please the Father? Those of us who desire in our hearts to follow the example of Jesus can learn something vital in our walk with God. We are not to please anyone or any group when we make decisions. Today in the United States, there is a phenomenon called political correctness. Political correctness is really an intent to please certain groups or to silence other groups. So you and I should not say illegal immigrants because we might displease the hard-working people who cross the border to make an honest living. You see, they also pay taxes when they buy coke. And so they contribute to the economy of the American society. Instead of calling them illegal, we're supposed to call them undocumented. And yet they violated the law. We should not say this crime was perpetrated by a Muslim terrorist because we might displease a certain segment of society. Instead, we should say workplace violence. You see how political correctness changes the term? We should not call them oriental because we might displease certain people by associating them with Arab. Because you see, oriental means oriental rub. <laughs> Instead, we should call them Asians. And we should not call them fat. <laughs> because the word fat is offensive. We need to call them curvy. <laughs> So right now, when I look at my wife, and in our intimate moments, I would ask her, how many curves do you have now? <laughs> we are told not to use the word disabled, but to say challenged. Don't use the word blind. Use visually challenged. So I was looking for the politically correct term for somebody who is becoming like me, you know, where somebody calls me and tells something, and I say, what? <laughs> Hearing impaired? <laughs> Auditorily challenged. Bumun. <laughs> In other words, that's the term for death. We cannot use that term. That's politically incorrect. My problem is when we refuse to say certain things in favor of political correctness, we might be diluting the truth. If you cross the border without coming through the proper channels, you violate the law. Therefore, you have done something illegal. When you terrorize people in the name of religious fervor, you are a terrorist, whatever brand of religion you may have. When you come from the East, you come from the Orient. For that is what East means. Occidental is the West. And the last time a medical doctor told me, if you exceed your ideal weight, you are fat. <laughs> and if it's 30 pounds beyond your ideal weight, you are obese. <laughs> when we are trapped with pleasing someone 
or pleasing some group, we are pulled away from actually declaring the truth. And do you know that the politically correct people will not allow you to call sin, sin? So lying is misspeaking. Adultery is alternative lifestyle. <laughs> Abortion is a woman's reproductive choice. Political correctness is an attempt to regulate speech and thought from public discussion. And so in the college where I'm teaching right now, whenever we, you know, there are Christians among us there, whenever we say something, we have to look around because somebody might hear what we say. The bottom line is, do not say what you see. Do not say what you actually experience. Perhaps by not talking about it, it will be resolved. Time will come that Jesus will no longer be called Savior of the world from death caused by sin. He will simply be referred to as tour guide in heaven. No wonder we are producing such dysfunctional citizens in this land because we can no longer say what we see. So if daddy is bald, we're not supposed to talk about it. <laughs> or when mommy's, one of mommy's legs is shorter than the other, we're not supposed to talk about it. You know what happens to the child? When the child actually sees something but cannot talk about it? You know what will happen to that child? <laughs> if you're not allowed to speak, and to talk, and to feel, and to comment, you are going to grow up with full what they call dysfunctionality. Yeah. <laughs> and then there is going to be a perpetuation of secrets in the family. Okay. Is your brother an alcoholic? No, we're not supposed to talk about that. <laughs> we have secrets. And secrets is very common in addiction. Oh, how life would be simpler if we follow the example of Jesus to please only the Father and not anyone else. I know it's not easy to do this, especially in the context of the workplace. But we have a choice. Are we going to please our Lord or are we going to just be politically correct all the time? And you, you know who dictates political correctness? Hollywood. That's where it's coming from. So let me conclude by saying that life through Christ is saved from judgment of death. This is true because to be in Christ is to be declared no longer guilty of sin. His grace is sufficient for every sin committed. Our Lord's judgment is for both the dead and the living, and His judgment is impartial. It is not governed by any external factor. It is only dispensed based on what happens here in the heart. In his little book, Illustrations of Bible Truth, author H. A. Ironside pointed out the folly of making judgment using all kinds of factors other than what happens in the heart. He related an incident in the life of a man called Bishop Potter. He says, he was sailing for Europe on one of the great transatlantic ocean liners. When he went on board, he found that another passenger was to share the cabin with him. After going to see the accommodations, he came up to the purser's desk and inquired if he could leave his gold watch and other valuables in the ship's safe. He explained that ordinarily he never availed himself of that privilege, 
but he said he had been in the cabin and had met the man who was to occupy the other part of the room. And judging from his appearance, he was afraid that he might not be a very trustworthy person. That's the reason why he wants to put his valuables in the safe. The purser accepted the responsibility for the valuables and remarked, It's all right, Bishop. I'll be very glad to take care of them for you. The other man in your cabin? also came here earlier and left his valuables here for the same reason you have. <laughs> we are forever thankful that our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us direction in His Word to escape judgment resulting from sin, offer us this judgment based on what happens in the heart. When we receive His forgiveness and life eternal and surrender our lives to His Lordship, He is going to give us life eternal. However, we need to make that response by faith. If you have not done this response. Today is an excellent opportunity for you to resolve this matter once for all. Will you take Jesus into your life so that you will be saved from judgment? Will you surrender your life to His Lordship? Will you accept His offer of forgiveness and life eternal? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. I have tried my very best to explain to you that life through Christ is saved from judgment. And today I'm going to offer you an opportunity to make that response of faith to Him. You have heard of the good news before, but you have not really made that decision to accept His offer of forgiveness and life eternal by surrendering to his lordship. If that is the desire of your heart, I'd like for you to stand quietly from where you are and I'll voice a simple prayer for you. Anyone? Make that commitment today as all heads are bowed and eyes closed. Anyone would like to respond to Christ by faith? It's not religion, it's not morality, it's not education, but His grace that we need to receive by faith. Will you do that? Simply stand wherever you are seated. Or you call yourself a Christian disciple already, but the Lord has convicted you today to re-consecrate your life afresh. Your life has not been productive. And the Lord is speaking to you. Will you make that commitment as well? Just simply stand wherever you're seated. And I'll voice a simple prayer for you. Anyone? so much for today. Thank you that you have allowed us to learn from your word and to clarify the glorious gospel of your grace in Christ. Thank you that once we receive your offer of forgiveness and life eternal, the offer of your grace in Christ, that we will experience salvation in a personal way and as a result of that our lives will change our works the goodness of our works will become results of the empowerment of your Holy Spirit in our hearts 
thank you for how you will continue to guide us all to live this life so that others will be attracted to our witnesses and many will come to love you and serve you through our examples. I pray that you will continue to bless with your continuing direction each individual in this church to honor you by unselfishly serving you through the using of their spiritual gifts. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.